We shall now move on to the next is have you all on the stage. Uh, it's good. Well, uh, Lieutenant General Kandari needs no introduction. Uh, he is the principal advisor at the Ministry of Defence. And before that, he has had an uh, illustrious career in, of course, the Indian Army uh, serving for the nation. Uh, he has had several important roles as the Chief of the Defence uh, Intelligence Agency. He's been the Deputy Chief of the uh, Integrated Defence Staff. And of course, we all know that he's been the Military Secretary at the National Security Education <coughs> Secretary as well. Uh, but he's someone who uh, has been speaking in detail about Atmanirbhar Bharat, uh, particularly in the defence sector. Uh, and that's the cue where I you know, take this forward. Very interesting topic that has been given to me. Uh, that is understanding India's strategic culture, self-reliance in defense, and India's twin front war challenges. Uh, I will come to the twin uh, war challenges a little bit later, but I want to understand from you, sir, that there has been something very interesting that has happened in the last few years uh, in the Atmanirbhar Bharat, in the self-reliant India campaign uh, that the Prime Minister Modi and uh, Raksha Mantri keeps on speaking about. We've had from Vikrant to Danush, from Arihan to Prachan, uh, from the startup challenges as well. Uh, but where does this take us? Uh, there is, of course, the critical technology challenge also that we are facing. Uh, there are heavy imports. Uh, so in next 10 to 20 years, where do you see India uh, with this entire campaign of Arpanitra Bharat, particularly in the defense sector? Uh, thank you, Aditya. This uh, question about Atmanirbha, you know, it's like a relay race. You start, you do one lap. Simultaneously, you prepare for the second lap. So when you, uh, when we started in 2019 in the defense sector, uh, we announced a list of about 101 products. Uh, along with that, we assigned a timeline. Everything is not possible immediately on the flick of a button. So there are certain technologies where you do mapping uh, by when will the country be ready for that? And you say, okay, after that, there will be no more imports. And that also gives a lot of planning parameters to the industry. Uh, among the industry also, uh, there are large-scale industries, there are medium-scale industries, there are startups. So all that will happen based on how you map what is your readiness level for manufacturing. Alongside, there are certain sensitive issues where strategic partnerships have to continue. And as the technology keeps growing, uh, we will have to keep on mapping uh, where is it that our friends will help us, uh, where is it that we will be able to help them. So it's a continuous process and uh, I'm sure you understand that this is a very complex web. There are too many parts in this, you know, there are the users who have to identify, there are the designers, the developers, the production agency, the investors, then uh, again the user comes into being and to bring the scale of manufacture, uh, you have the exports also. So that's where multiple ministries are also involved, multiple stakeholders are involved. So where do we see after 4 years, 5 years, 10 years, 15 years? Like I told you, this is a relay race, it's going to continue. I don't think you will come to a spot where you say everything is now stopped and uh, we are uh, in a well-to-do position. Uh, because of the technologies, uh, this continues to happen. And most important in this is a concurrent research and development and the investments in that. Well, uh, if I can now take this forward and put the roots of Arthur Bharat, that is the policy planning and strategic thinking in India. Uh, you know, when I see this entire topic that has been given to me, I divide it into three major areas. One is the strategic thinking, uh, you know, about foreign policy, the stand that India has taken, uh, that, you know, uh, the bullying that used to happen earlier and now the changing dynamics. Second is, of course, the national security. Uh, again, a very important subject for India. Uh, India has been a victim of terrorism and how India has taken a stand on terror uh, at Global Forum, including the United Nations. And there's been a shift in that as well. Because I remember two decades ago, there used to be terror attacks in mainland India. Uh, there used to be bomb blasts, uh, you know, every other day in UP, Delhi, Rajasthan, other places. 
but that has changed. Apart from you know Pulwama or a couple of other incidents, we don't see any major terror attacks in India. And third is of course the defence, and you know we have had a twin war challenge on that as well. But my question to you is about this new India that we keep on talking about, this new thinking that we keep on thinking about, and the paradigm shift in this thinking. How did this happen? And you know, we keep on saying that, you know, there used to be this frustration uh, among the people that India does not respond or there is no, uh, you know, recalibration of policy or, uh, you know, a narrative that goes completely against India, but India is not initiating a narrative. Uh, that there seems to be a certain change. And particularly, I say this in the last one year, you know, after the Russia-Ukraine conflict as well, when the kind of bullying that we saw, you know, from Europe or from the West, and India gave a response saying that India's interests matter the most and that's what it, you know, its foreign policy will shape accordingly. How do you see this? You know, Aditya, the, uh, the journey from 1947 onwards has been a very interesting journey. And uh, there were periods of turbulence and turmoil which you mentioned. I, I would label that as years of adolescence confusion for us. By the time we understood what needs to be done, uh, we had to go through the pieces to understand that this is not a binary problem. It cannot be only solved by kinetic means. You know, the, uh, there are elements of state which can be utilized uh, to ensure that uh, there is peace and stability here and the perpetrators are brought to book at international forum. And that's where the Ministry of External Affairs and the intelligence agencies worked very hard. And the same tools which had been used against us uh, were utilized against these so-called uh, neighbors of ours in this troubled neighborhood. And uh, it's a continuous process to understand what next to tighten the screws. And uh, uh, the kind of funding that was easily available because of which uh, we were seeing so much of agony in India because, you know, nobody likes to be at the receiving end of terrorism. And I very firmly when the political and the diplomatic leadership took a stand, no engagement as long as terror is not resolved. So I think uh, very clear lines were drawn. How did this happen? I think maturity. That is how it happened. Uh, what happens uh, subsequently? You know, I am a person who has worn uniform for uh, four decades. But I can tell you very clearly, no military person would want to drag his country into a war. We have to do everything possible to have deterrent value, maintain our sovereignty and continue to support diplomacy in a manner that it is meaningful. So that is where these twin pillars have to be strengthened at all times. Uh, military preparation is for that situation just in case. You should not be found wanting, otherwise what will happen is exactly a repeat of what happened nearly a thousand years back, where you were economically very strong, militarily you went down, and ultimately the entire country went down in dumps. So that is what is a constant endeavour to keep the military power strong. And in that, when I am saying military, I do not mean only the kinetic power. Kinetic and non-kinetic power has to be strong to ensure that peace prevails in this country and growth is at a constant rate. Something very interesting happened this morning. Uh, you know, in Washington Press Club, there was an event titled Transformation in Kashmir. And there were two panelists from Kashmir, uh, Mir Junaid and Tosi Frena. And while they were speaking, there, there was some Pakistani, uh, you know, person in the audience who tried to heckle me. And, uh, you know, there seems to be a transformation in this narrative and debate as well. Because earlier I used to see for decades, Kashmiris and Indians protesting at Pakistani events. And now Pakistanis are protesting at Indian and Kashmiri events, that too in the West. So, how has this happened? You know, it's been almost four years since the abrogation of Article 370 in Kashmir. Again, dynamics and there's been a paradigm shift in Kashmir. But I asked uh, uh, SM Sahai also yesterday that is terrorism and jihad 
now dying in Kashmir? Is it the beginning of the end? And how do you see this transformation? Because it is linked to the uh, issue of radicalization and politics as well. Some people say there needs to be a larger engagement with the common people. Others say there needs to be rootlessness uh, so that the roots of radicalization are completely eradicated. Aditi, you also know that uh, when uh, you have Neer Junaid and Tosif Rana, the new generation being represented, the voice of uh, the young, young people in Kashmir is now echoing uh, across the seas. Uh, who's frustrated? The old guard is frustrated, possibly. ISI is frustrated. And then there are paid elements who will do this. Heckling businesses, uh, it comes cheap. It's not very costly investment for people to do that. But I would say uh, this is a very pedestrian thought to heckle uh, the likes of Tosi Frena and Nir Junaid. Uh, finally, in social media, it has got more traction to them. Uh, so people who did this have not understood uh, what they were trying to do. It is counterproductive. So whether the new lot is getting attention, of course they are getting attention. Do they have ambitions for Kashmir? Of course they have ambitions for Kashmir. They never got a chance earlier uh, due to whatever the system was. But today they have a chance, they have a voice, they have a recognition. Uh, will the uh, trajectory continue in this manner? I think, I think it will continue. People in uh, the rest of the country, rest of the world, everyone is understanding that change is happening. You know for sure that uh, there is tremendous amount of investment which is coming into Kashmir. People have never seen this kind of an investment. UAE is one case who uh, they are bringing a lot of investment. You look at the railway line which is from Katra to Banyar. It's a fantastic railway line uh, which is coming up. Uh, you are from Kashmir, you know, even before this present uh, railway line which is there, people in Kashmir had never seen a railway line. So things are changing, things are changing fast. The only thing we have to guard against is we should not allow those radical elements to again come back and upset the other guy. Now, if I can come to the most critical of all questions, which is the Quinn War uh, you know, challenge. Uh, for last many decades, our focus was entirely on Pakistan. And ever since 2019 Taliban incident, there's been a complete shift towards China. Uh, the kind of resources, uh, the technology, the ammunition, uh, that we have, uh, you know, plugged in uh, in Ladakh, particularly in Eastern Ladakh. And apart from that, also, you know, not just militarily, but diplomatically also, we have kind of sidelined Pakistan completely, kind of ignored the irritant. But there's this other irritant, China, that is continuously there. And we know about China's, you know, hostile hegemonic tendencies completely in the region, not just towards India, but uh, all across. Uh, has there been a strategic evaluation of past and future? Because there's been a lot of criticism, uh, several articles written about it, several papers written about it by Indian and foreign authors as well, that uh, with China, the kind of stories that come out, you know, particularly of, on Eastern Ladakh, and we know about what happened in, uh, you know, Tawang as well, where, you know, India had to, you know, make a strong, uh, you know, presence there. So how do you see this kind of a challenge in future? Earlier it used to be called two and a half war, but I would say it's, it is just two front war because Kashmir is certainly something that is heading towards peace. So have we consciously thought of this, uh, that Pakistan needs to be completely ignored, that is not the main challenge here, and China's hegemonic tendencies, China's bullying, uh, is something that we need to take care of. Uh, the two front or two and a half front continues to be a challenge and I would not uh, want to wish away that half front. That half front may have been synonymous with Kashmir at a particular time, but that half front is more to denote the internal turbulence and turmoil which causes degradation effect and uh, it impacts the internal cohesion the most. Uh, most important for a country when it is handling any type of a threat which is external is to keep the internal cohesion intact. And to that extent that half run may shift geographically, but uh, it is very much a threat in the Indian society. So that takes care of the half part. Uh, the two front war, 
uh, the threat, it is there, it will remain, it's not going to go away. The degree or the relativity of it will vary. Uh, you remember our erstwhile Defence Minister George Fernandes had once very clearly identified many years ago as to which is the primary threat to India. And uh, at that point in time, uh, so many people heckled him, so many people uh, made him go back on what he had said. But actually that was the truth and it has uh, dawned again. So when you say that a lot of people have been writing, people were writing even then. We in the armed forces or the security sector are very clear what is the primary threat, what kind of preparation we need to do. And when it comes to such two-front threat, it's not only a military issue, it is a national issue. The various ministries, the intelligence agencies, everyone put together has to tackle these threats because these are threats not to the military but to the nation. So that is something which we have to see. And one part which is extremely important. Uh, in the in Indian history, uh, do we have such similar situation when our people, our leaders had faced multi-front threats? Yes. You look at Shivaji, how many threats he was facing at any one time? Leaderships and leaders have to learn from history and how to tackle it is more important. Such realities will exist. We have a good example of Shivaji, we have a bad example where the Vijayanagar Empire actually collapsed because five people uh, uh, colluded and uh, actually destroyed the uh, Vijayanagar Empire. I think uh, we need to continue to learn from history. Leaders have to particularly learn how to play one against another, how to play down something which can be played down, how to we'll have to handle it. So that is the way we will have to continue to do it. We obviously cannot change our neighbours and the psychology of our neighbours also doesn't seem to be changing with the uh, passage of time. I've been asked to wind up but uh, one final question since you know uh, we have uh, the advisor from the Defence Ministry here. Uh, a two part question if you could just briefly uh, answer me. One is about the integration of the armed forces. You know, a plan that had been under works for years together. We have the CDS, uh, we have the integrated defense staff, and uh, you know, a lot of talk about the multiple theater commands and the challenges from China. Uh, where are we heading in that direction? Where is the integration now uh, looking in the next few years? And second part of my question is about the information warfare that comes in that is uh, coming up as a massive challenge. How is India going to deal with this disinformation and information challenge? Most recently seen with the situation in Punjab and we had the High Commissioner from London uh, come out with a video statement that a lot of fake news about Punjab and the situation was struggling globally and that has led to violence not just in London but in Australia, in US and several of our global nations. So how does India, how does New Delhi or multiple ministries that are looking at it uh, working on tackling with this new menace of information warfare? Uh, very briefly, both the parts, although those require a lot of deliberation, but I will try and be as brief as possible. Uh, integration is the second step beyond jointness. Uh, we have been travelling on the path of jointness so far, and we are now graduating into integration. The first part, you are very right, the government's intent was clear, a firm decision in that direction of appointment, appointing the CDS. And the CDS is a person who is getting the three services to integrate and to economize on the effort so that we are able to make the best out of whatever resources we have. So integration, whether they are in terms of operations, intelligence, logistics, training, there are many fields where integration has to take place and it is happening. Uh, it cannot be again done uh, on the switch of a button. There are many things which are required. We have to prepare our leadership for that. And that is what is happening. Where are we? We are on the path of integration and very soon you might hear some issues on that. The, uh, uh, what was the second part? Information warfare is again... Uh, it is not uh, essentially only the role of the armed forces or the Ministry of Defence. And uh, that is where my past experience in the uh, NSCS, National Security Council Secretary, where many inter-ministerial gaps were covered, they were facilitated, 
the NSCS is not uh, essentially an execution authority, but they are facilitators. And we saw how the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting and all others used to pitch it. And uh, I think we have a long way to go. Private sector would do well because of the technology and kind of skill sets which our youngsters have. So overall direction will have to come from uh, elders and seniors and a uh, lot of proliferation uh, will have to be done. Uh, China has uh, really made a mark there. Pakistan has also been extremely important. In fact, there is an irony, I would say. Uh, Pakistan, in its equivalent of what we have a cabinet committee on security, uh, has the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting there. So they have spread, spread, uh, spread so much of falsehood that they have become victims of their own falsehood and you see what is the condition of Pakistan. Absolutely correct. Thank you so much, Jirakhandari. Thank you.